Thank you very much. Um, I have 10 minutes to tell you something about progressive web apps, uh, which is fine, because that's more than enough time. Uh, so yesterday, uh, you've showed you how to build a progressive web app, and they, they very wisely avoided defining the damn thing. Um, because there's a lot of confusion around uh, what is a progressive web app. There's this great uh, article by Ben Halpern, and it's literally called, What the Heck is a Progressive Web App? Seriously. Um, because not only is there confusion, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, just recently, there was a blog post on the, uh, by Diego Cunha, uh, and he said, a progressive web app is an enhanced version of a single page app with a native app feel, which to quote The Last Jedi, is impressive because every single uh, part of that sentence is wrong. Um, <laughs> but it's understandable because the, you know, before that there was an article on Hacker Noon and the title of the article itself was before you build a progressive web app, you need a single page app. Um, no, uh, Jake from Google has, has noticed, this is like, uh, we're kind of screwing up here. Uh, I've seen too many devs assume that progressive web app is a subset of single page app, and we need to improve our messaging. Uh, so I, I understand it because, of course, we look at a lot of the, uh, the really impressive progressive web apps, especially the early ones, right? Flipkart and, and things like that. And you look at uh, uh, the Twitter mobile app or Instagram's progressive web app, and they, they happen to be progressive web apps using that whole app shell model. So you could be forgiven for thinking, oh, right, I get it. A progressive web app is a single page app with other stuff on top. But no, um, I like this from Salva de la Puente, who said a progressive web app is a regular website following a progressive enhancement strategy to deliver native-like experiences by using modern web standards, which I like and I agree with, but it's actually not that useful either, right, in, in figuring out but what is a progressive web app, trying to define it. What does it mean? What is the meaning of this word? Well, to go right back to the source, Frances Berryman, who coined the term progressive web app, she said, basically, forget about it. She said, the name isn't for you. And worrying about it is distraction from just building things that work better for everyone, right? It's marketing, just like the term HTML5 had very little to do with uh, actual HTML. And I think she's right. It's like uh, progressive web app as a term and all these, these adjectives like rich and immersive and blah, 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 engaging. They're really useful if you're trying to convince a client or you're talking to the marketing department, all this. But if you're a developer or designer and you want to know how do I build this thing, you know, it's actually not that useful. You want, you want to know technically, what do I need to do to build this thing? Now, our kind sponsors, Google Developers, have got a whole section of their site about building progressive web apps, and they list a, a progressive web app checklist. Great, all right, we've got a checklist. And it lists all these things that a progressive web app should do, which is really useful, except I would say most of the things on this list are things that any website should do, right? It should be responsive, well, yeah. You know, should be fast. Yeah, right? I mean, we kind of want every website to, to fulfill most of these criteria. But I think that's a fair point, is that, you know, before you start concentrating on the specific things that make a progressive web app a progressive web app, make sure you've already got a good, usable, fast website already. Concentrate on that first. But if we, if we kind of split these apart and look at what are the things that are specific to progressive web apps, um, then it's pretty much exactly what you was talking about yesterday. It's that uh, site is served on HTTPS, right? That's just, you've, you just got to do that. Um, all app URLs load while offline. It doesn't mean that the, the exact content that you would get if you were online is available, just that something comes up when you're offline. And metadata provided for the add to home screen. Um, now, you showed yesterday how to, how to put that metadata together and how to launch a progressive web app in, in 30 minutes and the whole add to home screen thing. I wouldn't get too caught up on the add to home screen part. I think it can be a bit of a distraction. But uh, these, these three sort of ingredients are definitely what make a progressive web app a progressive web app. It's got to be running on HTTPS. Uh, it's got to uh, work offline. And it's got to have some kind of metadata. Now, from a technological point of view, HTTPS, OK, you should already be doing that. The metadata is provided by the web app manifest. We saw that yesterday. And the offline part is provided by a service worker. So why I find these three bits um, useful as when it comes to defining progressive web apps is that they're measurable, right? And all the tools that, that measure how good your site is as a progressive web app measure these kind of things, things like Lighthouse and, and SonarWall and PWA Builder, all these, these great tools, right? So I just want to look at, at the one part of it that I'm interested in, which is uh, making stuff work offline and the technology there is service worker. Now, 
offline covers a whole range of stuff. So I just want to show a couple of quick examples how, of what you could do from a user experience point of view, uh, what you could do uh, when someone's offline. So uh, here's a website, HuffTuffer.com. I built it like 10 years ago now. And if you're offline, you get a custom offline page. It's so really not very exciting. It's, it's ever so slightly better than showing the browser's default error message. It's kind, of, it's kind of like a branding opportunity, in the same way that having a custom 404 page is a branding opportunity or a chance to do something cute and clever. You could kind of do that here. Um, so I kind of do this now by default. At the very least, you know, have, have a custom offline page in the same way you'd have a custom error page. Uh, so for the website for this year's Ampersand conference, which web typography conference in Brighton, you should all come to it because it's awesome. Um, the all custom offline page, again, not that useful, but I list like the the, the minimum facts you'd probably want to know if you're, if you're thinking of coming to the conference or you're trying to get to the conference, right? Like, this is the date it's on, this is where it is, this is the time. Um, but, you know, it's, it, this is like bare bones. This is as basic as the offline experience gets. Um, Tobias will be talking about Trivago later today, and Trivago is a, a progressive web app. And if you're offline when using Trivago, um, you get to play a game a cute little maze game. So oh, that's really nice, right? So now we're kind of upping the, up the stakes. This is good. That's, like, that's, that's a really nice custom offline experience. Now, on the other end of the stack, here's another website I built a while ago, Resilient Web Design. It's a, it's a book. It's, it's available for free. The website is the book. And when I say free, I mean free. Don't give me your email address, and I'm not tracking anybody. It is actually free. And this is what it looks like uh, online, and this is what it looks like offline. Uh, it's exactly the same. The moment you visit resilientwebdesign.com, the, the, the website, the book, is, is installed onto your device. And from then on, it never goes to the network again. Now, this is extreme because a book, it's not going to change, maybe apart from the occasional typo fix, right? It's, it's a static thing. So I could make this decision that, yeah, it will be a completely offline first experience. Uh, most websites, that's not going to work, right? You, you just, it's on the web for a reason. You need to have access to the network for some stuff. So on, on my personal site, um, it's a blog and you know, links and stuff like that. And as you're browsing around, uh, let's say you lose the internet connection, I've got a custom offline page, but then anything that you've previously visited, uh, you can revisit. It's like, okay, you're offline, but here's what you were reading earlier, and you can reread it. Um, so that's a, a relatively easy pattern to implement, for, especially for like content sites. Um, Ethan has done the, the same thing on his website. Right? If you go offline, oh, hey, here's what you were reading earlier. Um, that's nice, but of course, I'm only showing you stuff you've already read, which isn't as useful as you know, giving you something new. Or, and, and also, um, I'm, I'm making assumptions about what you might want. And this isn't stuff you've explicitly chosen to read later. Uh, a, a nice pattern is to let the user decide. So Una Kravitz on, on her website has done this. So when you get to an article, there's that option with that, that arrow up there that you can uh, save for offline. So now you're, you can turn your site into a kind of a, a, a Instapaper uh, pocket for, for, for people when they're you know, in a situation where they don't have a network connection. Uh, and then once it's saved offline, at any point you can, you can read this, even if you don't have an internet connection. And Sarah Swedan did the same thing recently again. If you go to an article on her website, there's a button saying save this page for offline reading, and uh, you hit it, it's saving, and then, all right, it's saved for offline. So that's, uh, those are you know, text-based websites. It's pretty useful, but you could extend this to, to other media as well, because you get to store quite a bit offline. Um, this website is the archive for uh, Deconstruct, which is a conference we ran in Brighton for 10 years. And we've got the audio from 10 years of, of conferences online at, at this URL. And as you're browsing around the site, you get that same sort of option about saving this for offline. But now we're talking about saving uh, an MP3 file, not just like the, uh, the text of the page and the images on the page. So you. Uh, you hit that uh, saving, save for offline, and then when you're offline, you get the custom 404 page, and, but now you can listen to anything that you've chosen to save offline. So it's kind of like you've got a little podcast player that you can uh, listen to on the plane. So all of those are, are fairly uh, straightforward examples of just some examples of the offline experiences you can offer. And all of those websites I showed you are pretty simple websites. They're not uh, you know, big uh, multinational companies. So if they can do it, I feel like you know, the more complex stuff that you, all you are building, um, you could certainly do it. Um, and so to, to answer the, the question, you're like, well, should, but does that mean does every, should every website be a progressive web app? Um, yeah. Yeah, it should. I will echo what Aaron Gustafsson said in a list of parts in the article. Yes, that website should be a progressive web app. 
Um, that's all there is to it. And I haven't shown any code here, but if you are interested in learning how to do any of that stuff, yeah, I've written a book. It's called Going Offline, and it's available from abookapart.com. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>